this presentation will be the concrete properties, which is kind of an intro into the rest of the concrete structures. Um, so this will be how to set material properties for assessing any concrete structure. Uh, so this is our outline. Uh, we'll go through some upfront slides and then do a brief overview of um, the history of concrete technology. And then we'll get into the common material properties that we'll need and then have a little bit of discussion on how to use that in a risk assessment. So our objectives are just going to be understand what these properties are, how to select them, um, and how to use them. And just a note here at the bottom that most of this was developed with the intent of mass concrete. Some of it will apply for reinforced concrete, but we have other presentations on reinforced concrete. Our key concepts here are, you know, we're, we're dealing with risk assessments, so we don't want to just focus on design strengths. We want to understand the mean and variability of all of these concrete properties. Um, compressive strength is going to be important for correlating to other properties. Um, compressive strength, at least for mass concrete structures, isn't commonly a failure mechanism, but it's still an important property to understand. Um, tensile strength um, is, is fairly important, but it's difficult to measure. There's no universally accepted method, and there's a lot of factors at play that we'll talk about. Um, shear strength, when we're talking about mass concrete structures, um, this is going to come down to lift joints, um, which is going to deal with construction me methods and that kind of thing. All right, so this is a, a very abbreviated timeline of concrete technology. So when you come into a project and you need to assess your concrete properties, this is going to be one of the first lines of evidence to look at. So depending on the date of construction of your, of your structure, um, various different technologies would have been available. And so your structure may be vulnerable to, to various different things. So this is just uh, kind of the first step in understanding the, the concrete. Uh, next, you can start digging into any other data that's available for your structure. Um, this is kind of a, a hierarchy here for obtaining uh, data on your material properties. So up at the top, you have recent testing of cores. Um, this is this is the best source of evidence because it's the the in situ concrete at the current age you know cured and it's in its actual conditions so that's the best snapshot of what exists out there right now um, if you don't have recent testing of cores there may be core reports from the past in the project maybe during installation of instruments or previous um, investigations um, so those can be helpful but you need to take into account the age of those cores relative to your structure next is field data from construction. Um, so this is, is things like uh, cylinders that were cast during construction. So they're measuring material properties out there while they're doing the construction. Um, again, have to be careful with that because it's so early on in the life of the structure. Um, and, and field conditions, you know, curing conditions will be different um, in, a, in a cast cylinder versus a core. Next is other kinds of construction material, construction information. So you've got the materials they used, um, means and methods, how they placed it, how they cooled the concrete, um, all these kinds of things. Um, those those can all inform what the what the end strength of the concrete is. And then last is lab investigations from design. Um, so a lot of times when they were designing the mixes, they would have tested those mixes and you can get some information out of that. You have to be careful with those um, because you have to be careful that they were the actual final mix that was used in the construction. A lot of times multiple mixes would have been tested um, and one was selected. It's also common that they would have made changes during construction um, as they ran into issues in the field. So you have to be cautious with 
um, lab investigations from design. All right, so now we, we just get into uh, some of our material properties. Our first material is the concrete modulus. This can be measured by um, a, a standard compression test as long as the sample is instrumented to measure the strains. When we run those tests, they're usually run quickly enough that they're considered for dynamic loading. Um, for static loading, we take a two-thirds reduction to account for any long-term creep that may occur. Um, you know, you can you can also use correlations to come up with this parameter, correlate from compressive strength. And there, there can be a lot of variability in this parameter, sample by sample, but once averaged out through the structure, um, the, the range of variability tightens up quite a bit. So usually we can run some sensitivity analysis on this property and kind of hone in on a mean value to use. All right, next we'll do concrete compressive strength. Uh, so the first slide here is just um, contrasting design strength versus in place strength. So structural engineers, when we design structures, we're used to thinking about the term FC prime. FC prime is, is defined in this first bullet here. So it's it means the average of any three consecutive tests is equal to or greater than the specified value at 28 days and no test less than 500 PSI below that specified value. So that's the that's the value we assume in all of our design calculations and it's defined that way so that we can be sure that we're actually getting that. Now to meet that criteria when you do the mixed design for your concrete um, you want to make sure that that you meet that requirement so you'll usually design the mix for a higher strength. So a common practice is 1.34 standard deviations above FC prime. Then it's, it's stated there that all these tests are run at 28 days, um, which is, is pretty young relative to a, a project with a you know, 50 or 100 year design life. Um, and we know that the strength gain beyond 28 days is very significant. We also, we also see that these tests are going to be conducted on cast cylinders. And there's a difference between the curing environment of a cast cylinder and the in-situ concrete. And the, the curing environment in the in-situ concrete is often better. And so you'll get usually a higher strength in the um, in-situ cores taken from the concrete compared to those cast cylinders. So when you take all that together, um, your FC prime, which is stated in all the design documents, is going to be too conservative for a risk analysis. So when we go into a risk analysis, we'll usually want to take that FC prime, increase it to its mean value, and then try to con take into consideration the age of the concrete from that 28 days. Um, and you know, FC prime is, is the common parameter, so I talk about it here. Um, when we're talking about mass concrete, though, and, and large dams, one important consideration is the heat of hydration and controlling that heat. And one way to reduce that is to have a lower strength concrete. So a lot of times our mass concrete won't supply an FC prime, or it'll give a different definition of the design strength. So maybe it's a 90 day strength or a one year strength or something like that. So just be careful you understand uh, how things are defined in those design documents. So how do we age that strength? So there are um, published reports out there that um, give aging curves for different types of cement. Um, this is one for type four cement. This is type two cement. It can be used to age something from 28 days or whatever, whatever was specified to the current age of the concrete. Um, we wanna be careful with these. Uh, depending on your curing environment. So these plots are from you know, continuously moist cured samples. If you happen to be in a situation where um, there's not water around for the hydration reaction to continue, um, you may get less strength gain than this. Um, you may also be at the high end of this if you're in like a submerged environment or something like that. So I have to take into consideration the actual 
uh, physical processes that are occurring. All right, next we'll move on to concrete tensile strength. Uh, so just some concepts here. So this is gonna be important for seismic analysis a lot of times. It tells us when we go from a, a linear analysis to a nonlinear analysis. For mass concrete, lift joints are gonna be the weak point, and so they're gonna be very important. Um, there's There are different ways to measure tensile strength, and they have pros and cons, and we'll, we'll talk through that. Um, there's, there's changes in tensile strength based on strain rate. Um, there are also uh, cyclic fatigue factors that we want to consider. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the difference between nonlinear strength versus uh, apparent linear strength and other things that can affect this like aggregate size and moisture conditions. So the three most common tests to measure tensile strength are splitting tension, direct tension, and flexure or modulus of rupture. So we'll just talk about each of these in turn. So the first one is the direct tension tension test. So this is the, the most intuitive test. Um, and just as this figure shows here, we just secure our um, sample to the load platens for a tensile load and just pull the pull the sample apart, measuring the load, and that gives us our, our tensile strength. Um, so this is, like I say, intuitive. It's, it's testing the tensile strength directly. Um, the other methods will kind of be indirect. Um, and so, and, and it's applying a uniform tension throughout this sample. So that means any weak point in here is gonna break at that point. You can put a lift joint in here and test it at any point. And if that lift joint is the weak point, it'll break there. Um, the issues with this test are it, it can be somewhat difficult to perform correctly. So for example, if you're transporting that sample and it starts to dry out some, you can get some little micro fractures on the edges of the sample from that drying process. And those micro fractures, since everything is in uniform tension will then start the cracking prior to um, what would have happened if it if it hadn't dried out. So it can be very sensitive to those um, drying cracks. Um, it's also sensitive to placement into the machine. So it, it really needs to be perfectly straight up and down to get that uniform tension throughout. Um, if there's even a little bit off, it's gonna concentrate the tensile stress on one side of the of the sample or the other, and it's going to cause the sample to um, break sooner than it would have. So this test will usually give um, lower values than than other tests. Um, now I'll talk about this a little bit later between apparent and nonlinear tensile strength, and this test is measuring the the actual nonlinear tensile strength. All right, so the next test is a splitting tension test. Uh, so this, this test is performed pretty simply. You have to take a, a circular sample. So this can either be a core or a cast cylinder. In this case, it's a, a cast cylinder. And you place it on its side and put it in a, in a compression machine. And that compression just squeezes that uh, circular section down in between these two load points and introduces um, tension at the center of this along the plane between those two load points. And we'll just split that cylinder um, right in two. So if you slow it down, um, you can see that initiation of the tension crack right there. And so if we assume that, that this is a elastic material we can back out from the load that caused that cracking to initiate. We can back out what the tensile stress is right there. So since we're we're getting at it in an indirect way through a, through a, um, theory of elasticity, um, we're not measuring the nonlinear tensile strength. We're measuring more like the apparent linear tensile strength. And I have a, a figure a little bit later to explain that a little bit better, um, but. Because of that, it's going to give a higher tensile strength than the direct tension test. 
Um, and then on top of that, you know, where the where the direct tension test would fail at the weakest point in the sample, this test it's always going to force the failure along this plane because that's the that's the portion of the sample that's in tension. So it's not testing necessarily the weak point. And in fact, if this is a core and you have lift joints, they're probably not going to be oriented in this direction uh, because you probably drilled vertically. And so you can't really test those lift joints. And because you're forcing that failure plane through a particular location, um, it will it will have to crack through aggregate and things like that that are that are crossing that plane. So this will usually give um, a higher tensile strength than that direct tension test. All right, next is the flexure test um, or modulus of rupture test. So this one, we take a beam and we simply support it and then load it up at its third points. And when we load it at those two points, the, the section between those third points be, um, is loaded in uniform bending moment. And so then kind of similar to the splitting tension test, um, we can back out when this thing breaks what the tension was in that extreme fiber. We introduce that tension in that extreme tension fiber, and we can we can back out what that is that initiates that crack. Um, so since we're backing it out again from elastic properties, this is the apparent linear strength, and because we're we're actually targeting that in this in this test, this is often called a modulus of rupture, where modulus of rupture is kind of a synonym for that apparent linear tensile strength. Um, so this is a, a pretty good test because you can you can put a weak plane in the in between those two third points and it'll it'll break on that weak plane. So if you have a, a lift joint you want to place in there, you can do that. Um, this this video here is shown with a uh, prismatic section, but uh, there's no reason you can't do a core with it. You just have to rework the equations to back out that that tensile stress. Um, so this is this is a good test, particularly if you're interested in that apparent linear strength. So those are the three main types of test. Um, there are differences of opinion on on which one is best. Really, you just have to understand what the three of them are measuring, what the pros and cons are. Um, if you if you have multiple tests when you go into a risk assessment, you know discuss those strengths and weaknesses. Um, if you're going into a, a testing program, you know base your testing on what you actually need to measure. Um, but the rest of this part on uh, tension tests is going to be kind of our best practices for how to select a reasonable tensile strength. And a lot of times we won't have any, any tensile testing data at all. And so we find ourselves um, correlating from the compressive strength, which we have a better handle on. So first couple slides here are the publications that we use to do that. Uh, the first one is is Rayfield 1984. Um, he took a, a big database of compression tests and tensile tests and just ran a correlation on them. And he drew distinctions between the, the true tensile strength and the apparent tensile strength, which I've mentioned a couple of times, but it's illustrated over here. So this solid black line, this is the stress strain curve that you would get out of a direct tension test. So as you're approaching the tensile strength, your curve bends over and you get some nonlinear deformation as cracking forms through that sample. And then you hit your actual tensile strength up here. Now with those tests where we're backing it out from um, linear elastic theory, we're still at that same strain when the, when the concrete actually breaks. But what we're calculating is assuming a straight line modulus. And so we're getting a, a somewhat higher tensile strength up here at A. So that's the difference between apparent tensile strength and the direct tension tensile strength. And again, we, we often call this A point up here the modulus of rupture. 
So in Rayfield's paper, he correlated both um, apparent strength and the actual strength. And that was about a 30% or so increase between the two. And then he also differentiated between a static tensile strength and a seismic or dynamic tensile strength. And for that, he recommended a 50% increase. So here are his, his four curves from that. Somewhat later in 1995, um, Bob Cannon did an assessment of that old report, um, trying to come up with recommendations for RCC. Um, and this is documented in this engineering pamphlet down here. Uh, but when he went, went through Rayfield's data, um, he, he agreed that, that it's a good starting point, um, but a lot of the data in Rayfield's data set was um, normal size aggregate. Um, for mass concrete, we often have much larger aggregate, and so he recommends a 10% reduction off of those correlations for large aggregate. Um, he recommended the direct tension correction to be about 20%, and he confirmed the 50% increase for dynamic tensile strength. And then, of course, he noted if the concrete has, is ASR affected or otherwise damaged, then you don't want to use this stuff. Um, ASR will you know, coat the aggregate um, with kind of a gel that has no tensile strength, and so your, your tensile strength will almost completely go away if you have ASR affected concrete. All right, so that, that kind of gets us from a compressive strength to a good estimate of our parent concrete tensile strength. Um, but then we want to consider these lift joints. So these are, these are often going to be the weak link in a mass concrete structure. Um, and then to make matters worse, just for convenience of construction, lift joints are often placed at geometry changes. Uh, where we can get stress concentrations. <clears throat> so they're the weak point and they, and they get the stress concentrations. So the strength of lift joints is really dependent on the joint preparation and cleanup. Um, so this fourth bullet down here just lists some um, good practices, so green cut joints, water curing, low water cement ratio, rich mix with small aggregate adjacent to the joint, and good concrete layering and vibration. So if you do all of those things very well, then you can start approaching the parent concrete tensile strength. So as an example, um, cores out of the Hoover Dam, uh, the lift joints were found to be about 92% of the parent concrete strength. Um, and of course, if you don't do all of these, you start trending towards zero tensile strength. And if you, if you have unbonded lift joints, then it's gonna be zero and you can be anywhere in between. This is just a um, photo of a few different good concrete placement practices. So here they are placing it with a tremie. Here they're vibrating it in place. And here they're, they're green cutting it, um, cleaning up the joint, exposing the aggregate for the next placement. All right, so this is kind of a summation of all of that data and do our best practices. Um, so if, if you're starting from a compressive strength, use the splitting tension strength correlation from Raphael listed here. Um, and then you can, you can correct that to a direct tension or modulus of rupture using these multipliers. Um, correct small aggregate, which is the assumption in that equation to large aggregate, parent concrete to a lift joint, static loading to rapid loading, and nonlinear strength to apparent linear strength. Um, if you have a particular test data and you need to correct it to something else, you can, you can use this as well. It's not just for the correlation. Um, and of course, you want to consider the particulars of your situation. So this is, you know, a well-prepared lift joint is 0.85. If you have a, a poorly prepared lift joint, you want to use, you know, something lower than that. Okay, so up to this point for the tensile strength, we've been really talking about a monotonic loading. So we just load it one time all the way up until it fails. Um, but what if you what if you're in a cyclic loading situation where it's not quite getting to that tensile strength, but it's getting somewhere near it multiple times? 
Well, like that stress strain curve I showed um, illustrated, you start cracking as you start approaching that. So you're, you're doing damage to that concrete the closer you get to that tensile strength. So the second time you cycle up to it, it's gonna it's gonna potentially fail sooner. Um, so there's not there's not a whole lot out there on this. Um, there's no definitive um, report or anything. The closest thing that we've found is this Corps of Engineers report listed here. Um, and th and this report found that when when cycled to 60% of the estimated strength, none of their specimens sales none of their specimens failed. Um, and when cycled to 80% of the estimated strength, about 24% of the specimens failed. So you can see between that 60 and 80% is where you're getting into that nonlinear region where you're, where you're actually damaging the concrete. Um, they also noted that um, all of their samples were dry and when they tested dry samples under rapid loading, they got no strength increase where they did get strength increase with wet samples. Um, and this is consistent with a lot of other reports um, and, and that dynamic increase in strength is, is somewhat controversial. Um, so it, it may be that that's coming from poor water pressures taking that additional um, load. So you wanna, you wanna be careful with your concrete and not account for that strength if, you're, if it's a, a really dry concrete. Um, usually in this context, we're talking about, um, you know, concrete dams and things like that that are, that are usually wet. So um, we'll often take this, this increase. Okay, so you may start your analysis with a linear elastic analysis, and then you'll need to compare your stresses to these tensile strength that you've just calculated and then decide, um, do I do I need to do more nonlinear analysis? Is it is it acceptable? Um, so this slide gives a little bit of guidance on that. So if the envelope of stresses shows only limited areas that exceed about 75% of the tensile strength, you know you're below that um, threshold for that cyclic fatigue. Um, so you're you're probably not getting a whole lot of cracking, and so you're you're probably okay. If the envelope of stresses is exceeding that tensile strength over you know 20% or more of the area of concern, then you're probably going to expect significant cracking, and you probably need to do a, a more rigorous analysis. Um, if you're in between those, it's a little bit of a gray area, so we can use these performance curves to assess those situations. So this is this is loosely based on um, what's published in one of our EMs. It's a little bit corrected to the um, dynamic tensile strength that we've just discussed in the in the rest of these slides. And then the idea is that you're just summing up the time you're above the cyclic fatigue limit, and you can decide if you're um, going to get significant cracking. If you exceed that curve, or you have you know large areas that are exceeding the tensile strength, then you need to go to um, a nonlinear analysis using these concrete cracking models that are available in most nonlinear finite element programs. Um, this, this slide is really just kind of a word of caution. Um, these these uh, concrete cracking models are often kind of opaque. Um, you can't really tell what they're doing other than running multiple tests. So it's important to, to make sure you you think that they're working appropriately by comparing it to test data, um, maybe run multiple concrete cracking models and that kind of thing. All right, our last uh, material property is going to be concrete shear strength. <clears throat> Again, this is this is based on mass concrete primarily. So in that context, our uh, shear strength is going to be a direct a direct shear strength. Um, unlike reinforced concrete, where we're looking at kind of diagonal cracking. So this is just a kind of cautionary slide on when you're using that direct shear data. Um, the failure envelope that you test will often be nonlinear. And if you're looking at, a, at an unbonded joint, for example, you know that the cohesion should go through zero. But if, you're, if your data is not close enough to zero, then it'll appear that you have some cohesion. So 
be careful with that apparent cohesion and really just make sure that your testing is done at the normal stresses that your structure is actually going to be um, exposed to. If you don't have any data, um, these are some databases you can use to come up with estimates on your shear strength. So on the left here is a bonded lift joint. On the right here is an unbonded lift joint. Um, another, another cautionary slide here to be careful with strain compatibility when you're looking at shear strength. So if you have a lift joint that's partially bonded, um, you can't just simply add the strength from the unbonded and bonded portions because they won't hit their peak strength at the same strain. So a lot of times we'll only account for the peak strength of the bonded portions until that's broken, and then we'll account for the strength of all the unbonded areas on that plane. Uh, so then when once you've got all of your properties, you've got your mean and standard deviation, um, what do you do with those? When you go in your analysis, <clears throat> if you're doing a static analysis, you can often do a, a Monte Carlo analysis where you're sampling off of those distributions. Um, for seismic analysis, uh, you know, depending on the complexity of it, you may be able to do that. But a lot of these seismic analyses take so long to run that that's really not feasible. And we end up just having to run our mean values and then do some sensitivity runs on um, the bounds or plus or minus standard deviations to get an idea of how how our uh, response of our structure is affected by variability of our material properties. And then we can um, discuss those and come up with our probability estimates. Uh, and then this is, is the last slide here, just some takeaway points, um, you know, concrete modulus, run some sensitivity analyses, come to a mean value. Generally, you don't need to to vary it. Um, Monte Carlo analysis for static analysis, dynamic analysis, focus on the mean values and do some sensitivities around that. Um, demand capacity ratios are, are going to be needed for your tensile stresses and use that guidance here in this presentation to interpret those demand capacity ratios. Um, once you've cracked through, then you'll need to start taking a look more closely at the shear strength.